Hello and welcome back to Curiously Polar, the show about everything very north and very south. My name is Chris Bockward and this is Henry. Hello, how are you today? <laughs> tough to say something if you're being put on the spot um it is a monday well when we're recording this it is a monday in november and christmas is coming closer and uh i'm not really sure where to go from here from christmas to so you're really over. in christmas mood already <laughs> i'm in christmas yeah totally chris i should should actually start putting some some lights behind me some christmas lights behind me I might oh we already have one. we have huh? some already in in the house yeah. We do have some lights in the house, yeah. Um, so, let's see. We have, uh, last episode we started talking penguins, and we are doing that again today. And, uh, but today about different penguins, don't we? Emperor penguins. What, so what, have, emperor what have you brought penguins? us from the emperor penguins? I have brought an uh, interesting story from a very uh, certain area uh, in Antarctica, and that's Halle Bay. Um, that's a area in um in the area of the Weddell Sea so we have like the big uh, Ron Fulkner shelf ice which dominates the Weddell Sea and then the open Weddell Sea is not that open most of the time we have a sea ice cover there and that's the habitat of uh, emperor penguins and I would really love to focus on the ones of uh, Halle Bay today because we have quite an interesting story there have you heard about Halle Bay before no, I haven't. You haven't. It's quite an interesting spot, actually named after a research station from the British Antarctic Survey, which I think was first erected in 1955. And I think it's the sixth station uh, they have right now um, on the spot there. And um, the station is not situated on the sea ice, but on the ice shelf of the Brunt ice shelf that um, yeah emerges there from uh, the from the glacier coming down from Antarctica, and uh, yeah just drains into the Weddell Sea, and in front of the uh, Brunt ice shelf, uh, on the fast ice on the on the sea ice that's connected to the ice shelf or to the coast, um, a brick a, a very big. Um, Emperor penguin colony um, used to be so as a as a large spot the second largest um, emperor penguin colony um, known and we have to to just consider the um, yeah, temperatures and uh, like the really the the whole setup of uh, Antarctica we have minus sixty degree um, centigrade in winter time we we'll have wind speeds up to two hundred kilometers per hour and then you have a uh, species that actually comes there to breed, not during summertime when it's accessible, but during wintertime. So I have a question, just a general question for those who are new. Um, last week we talked about Gen 2 penguins, Gen 2 penguins. Um, what is the main difference between the Gen 2s and the uh, emperor penguins? Uh, the size. Emperor penguins are the largest penguin species we have um, on the planet. And Gen 2 penguins are significantly smart, uh, smaller. So we're talking about um, 115, 120 um, centimeters Do you, uh, do you know how much uh, an emperor penguin weighs? Is it comparable to a human? Is it bigger? Is it smaller? Um, it's, I think, 55 uh, kilograms. So it uh, can get up to okay. 55 kilograms. So it's um, a small human uh, from, from weight. Um, significantly heavier than the size would um, suggest. <laughs> There's and a lot of fluff around them, I guess. It's not only fluff, it's also uh, a big um, insulation layer of blubber, fat. Um, ah, because okay. of the, the environment, minus 60 degrees centigrade is something you have to survive, you have to prepare for. So all summer, an Arctic summer, they're just constantly tr uh, trying to build up that fat um, to actually have a reservoir. And... Um, the reason why they need that is not only that we have those temperatures during uh, winter time, it's also the breeding cycle that actually is very, very special um, and very distinct to other penguin species. Most penguin species come to Antarctica, uh, come ashore during summertime in the Antarctic summer. And as we can see here on the chart from the BBC is that um, emperor penguins come to the shore in March April. That's autumn. 
it's all it's the beginning of winter in Antarctica and then they come ashore they start breeding in April they lay their egg in around May with the hatching chicks in the midst of winter June July and can you imagine that you bring a child onto this world in the most hostile environment you can imagine again we talk about minus 60 degrees 200 kilometers per hour wind speeds in a pitch black on arctic ice cold environment that's crazy because that if you look at most mammals uh, at least here where we live in the northern hemisphere uh, I, I would think most mammals are come, come on this world in the springtime that's when all that happens or a lot of that happens so this is weird this sounds like a bit counterintuitive to me it it does um it, it sounds really weird and after the the female has has laid the egg because she really drains all her energy during that process of raising the egg and um just yeah just um um laying it she just uh, hands over the act to the to the male and then just uh, leaves for the ocean to um yeah to to to, to forage to actually hunt for uh, for food so in the midst of winter the male takes over the act and um actually breeds it for for hatching so the the young's hatch in june july and then in the midst of that cold one they just really stay as close as possible on the um, feet of the males under there. They have a pouch in that pouch um, until they are getting uh, larger and larger. So the males who have been during that whole process since they arrived in April, they have been on shore. They had no time and no chance to feed. So they feed their chicks on the reservoirs that have built up that's why i meant they really need to build up during summer enough reservoirs uh, reserves to actually be able not only to maintain their own survival but also to feed the chick so once the um female comes uh, returns around august the female and the male are just uh, interchanging so one is going out one um, is staying with the chick until they reach a point that both leave at the same time and the chicks are just forming a huge kindergarten group called crash and you have usually one or two or possibly three four um adult emperor penguins who are taking care about a huge bunch of uh, young juvenile birds that's a a pretty spectacular so it, it um, is, it sighting. It sounds very organized, like a real kindergarten. It is really organized. So those um, breeding colonies of uh, emperor penguins, they, they work together. They, they only can survive this very hostile environment if they work together. With those wind speeds, a single bird would not survive, even though they're very well insulated through a very thick layer of, of, of blubber and a very dense layer of feathers very um, yeah, closely light uh, on, to, on top of each other. But because of those very hostile um, uh, climate environment, you, you have to stick together as a group. So they also form a breeding crash. They uh, f uh, form a breeding so uh, circle um, where everybody at one point has to stay on the outside and then, um, yeah, they, they, they move circular and they, they move towards the inside. So at one point, everyone also reaches the middle until then um, gets passed towards the outside again so everybody has the chance to be sheltered as much as possible from the wind but also has to shelter the rest uh, from those very strong winds and the and the cold so only by working together i know they can survive as a group there and the same goes um for the chicks later on when summer arrives uh the chicks only can survive as a group and then you have to have a few adults who take over over uh you know, guarding over the uh the, the crash of, of young birds while the vast majority of adults can just go out and um yeah just f feed for themselves but also feed the the chicks on return obviously so that's a very very organized um way of doing so but here comes the the special thing on on, on Halley bay it has been the second largest um uh, emperor penguin uh, colony after um one uh, close to uh, in the ross sea but in 2016 for the very first time the scientists from the british antarctic survey have um discovered that 
uh, a huge catastrophic breeding failure has uh, occurred. And what does that mean? That actually means that in the midst of the of winter, heavy storms have yeah, pitched into the Waddell Sea and has have broken off the um, sea ice, the fast ice, and by that have destroyed the breeding grounds of the emperor penguins, which means that the freshly hatched uh, young emperor penguins, they weren't able to swim to survive that. They weren't able to feed on their own. The, the, the feathers, the grey feathers of the, of the uh, chicks, of the emperor chicks, is just not made to insulate in water. That's really just to keep them warm ashore from wind, and also not too strong winds. It's really just a summer dress, if you like. But they're not really made for going into water already. And that's just a, yeah, a death sentence. And that just happened in 2016. And um, wow. in the following years, 2017 and 19, the scientists have figured that the, the sea ice didn't recover from that accident. And the, the winds have been just constantly being strong. So the sea ice couldn't reform. So the... Um, catastrophic failure, breeding failure, has just continued for three years in a row until wow. just a very, very few um, adults have been left to return to that site. That site has diminished. It's just a super small spot now compared to what it used to be. Um, so just a few birds have returned, and that's just something um, that's, that's very um, interesting in terms of of the the reasons behind and if we look at the at the chart we have here we can see the the bronze ice shelf and we can see um where the the circle is um with the with the ice breaker in it um for for all those who are just listening on on the podcast just hop over to youtube and just have a look um under the uh, circle picture of, of the ice breaker slightly to the left we have a uh, indentation pretty much at the peak at the left peak of uh, the bronze ice shelf that's where the fast ice used to form that um, penguin colony which has kind of destroyed uh, has been destroyed so those penguins possibly have relocated that's something that's um, in uh, in debate right now but we have to also see that as kind of good timing because what we can see here in that um, particular picture is we have a number of cracks going through that ice shelf we have one crack which has been known for over 30 years almost 35 years it's called chasm one and chasm one has just formed very very close to the coastline 35 That's years ago the blue ones on the bottom here Exactly, that's the blue one up, uh, on the bottom, and Chasm 1 is the largest one. It has moved tremendously in those 30 years, but it kind of has maintained quite a stability. It hasn't um, grown, it has just moved, it has changed its position, but it hasn't grown much. And in the past 10 years, it has changed its speed, it has changed its behavior. So we have here a huge crack that just started to go open. It's not only it's several meters wide, it's also incredibly deep. And that crack just exhilarated and traveling further north. It uh, travels further an area which we can see on that map called McDonald Ice Rumpels. And that's a very interesting and a very important uh, part of that ice shelf. Because here on the McDonald Ice Rumpels, we have an elevation in the seabed. So we have basically sea mounds, and those sea mounds, they actually ground the ice shelf. That means that that huge body of ice that comes down from the Antarctic mountains just drains into the, into the ocean, where it floats, and then they just run onto those sea mounds, onto those mountains underwater. Though, so the ice just uh, grounds there, it got stopped. It changes the flow pattern of the ice shelf behind. It's kind of a stopper. And what you can see here is that those ice rumbles, they form a certain pattern on the surface. It's, it's uh, comparable to uh, cream cheese or honey. Just pour some honey onto a small dish and put your finger in the middle of the dish and see what happens to the honey. The honey will just 
stop behind your finger it will just flow around it and where it flows around it will just slow down while behind your finger there is there, there will be like the, the thickest part of that honey and something similar happens here so we have the the break off around those ice rumples because we have quite some pressure here you have to imagine there is pressure still coming from the mountains behind us draining down into the uh, Weddell Sea and this ice is just running onto the uh, ice rumples so what happened here is that this um, your topographic feature that um, separates the the Bront ice shelf in two areas we have a, a western part and we have an eastern part and they are both separated by a new crack that just got discovered in October 2016 and that was uh, pretty much the moment when the Halley um, research station just got relocated so the British Antarctic Survey has just uh, investigated the huge crack Chasm 1 for a number of years has seen that the speed of extent has accelerated and just decided to move with a whole Antarctic research station. And that's just not a few containers. We're talking about 18 modules here, which are on top of the ice shelf. So it's a huge effort. So, and so they they're, moving this, they're moving this closer to land. So in case this ice shelf separates, they won't drift out into the sea. Is that why? Exactly. So they okay. try to get they, they try to get um, on the land side of that huge crack that formed uh, thirty years ago, and that took them a while. But they relocated in uh, the summer two thousand sixteen, two thousand seventeen. So which is like uh, over New Year's, and the new position Halle six A is more closer to the Antarctic continent. But then in October 2016, a new crack just formed. End of October, it was um, discovered the first time, and that's why it's called Halloween Crack. And that's the thin blue line on top of the Halley 6A station, which actually extends almost all the way to the ice rumples. And why is that Halloween Crack so important for the research station? You see that Chasm 1 has extended quite a lot towards the ice rumples. So now the scientists are not really sure if that crack extends further towards the ice rumples or if it meets somewhere else with the Halloween crack. And by that it would just release the whole western tip of the Brunt ice shelf, which would just release a big iceberg, by far not the largest one, not even in the top 20 of largest icebergs um, carving from Antarctica, but still a significant size two times the area of New York City. But what we see here is that it's very, very um, difficult to forecast where this crack will break off. And by that, it just threatens the research station because it actually is um, cutting off the emergency uh, evacuation route, which usually goes over the Weddell Sea with icebreakers close to the edge of the ice shelf. If you have a, uh, a huge crack breaking off this huge ice shelf, you have a significant risk there, which is uh, very difficult to assess an uh, iceberg of that size. You don't want to face uh, from very close. So this is really something they needed to consider. So they just decided in 2017 that they evacuate the station every winter. And that's what's happening since then. It's uh, It has turned into a summer station only, which is kind of a waste. It's a, it's a brand new station. It's, um, it's very top-notch um, facilities on there. It's a really uh, good station, has very good facilities. But just because of the threat of not being able to evacuate the scientists uh, in time, they just decided to shut it down every winter. That's crazy. And we have some more pictures um, for you on the YouTube channel. And this is for from, from uh, ESA, uh, the, the European Space Agency, where you actually see a comparison um, picture within the 30 years span. So you can see on the on the left side, you can see the 30 year old uh, picture from 85 or 86. And you can see that the ice shelf is not um, as far extending into the sea as it is now on the 
On the right side, you see the iShelf as it was 2019. And uh, Chris is just sliding over. So you see the older version of the ice shelf. And that's very interesting because you so see it where has the grown slider since. is. It, it has moved further into the sea. But if you would put the uh, the, the, the slider further to, to the right side, where the slider is now, you can see those two cracks very close to the coastline. That's Chasm 1 and Chasm 2. That's the two cracks that formed ah, around 85. So they have formed due to the movement of the ice shelf. And you can see it, the, the, those uh, chasms, those cracks, they have traveled far in those 30 years. And Chasm 1 has extended significantly. Now you can see how large that is. The ice rumples in, 2000, uh, in, in 1985, they haven't been that much of, uh, of an obstacle because the ice shelf barely reached the ice ramples that was the outer edge of the ice shelf since then more ice drained down from the continent onto the ocean and by that it just flows around the ice ramples as the example with the honey um around the finger on a plate i think this is really interesting because it, it kind of shows this a b comparison here i this is a ama this amazes me totally because it really shows how ice is a, is a liquid, basically. It flows like like very, very um, viscous honey, as you said. And yeah, this is, this is mind-blowing. There are just very few examples to, to really give that credit. And honey is one of them. Uh, cream cheese is kind of uh, stuff like that, <laughs> yes. where, you, where, you really, where you really see um, a very thick, a very viscous... Um, uh, substance just flowing down somewhere and when you have yeah. obstacles they it, it flows over those obstacles as well ice will just break um, over those obstacles and that's something you can see here um, in the ice shelf you see those all those cracks all those cracks are natural there's nothing bad behind that that's just how ice behaves when it changes its flow dynamics so we have those pre- um, defined break of sections and chasm one is such a predefined uh, break of section so the carving event itself is kind of a natural um, thing in the life cycle of an ice shelf it will at one point get instable enough to break off and then form an iceberg the speed on what that happens that's something that's uh, concerning because what we have uh, on an ice shelf is a particular situation that the water, the sea water, reaches under the ice shelf. So we have a higher melting um, or surface melting on the bottom of the ice shelf rather than on top of it. The top is kind of insulated by snow. You have uh, fresh snow falling onto the ice, so that's insulating it from uh, solar radiation and from uh, warming atmosphere. But the bottom with the um, steadily um, warmer ocean is just attacked tremendously. So you have a salty ocean, a warmer getting salty ocean that attacks the ice shelf from underneath, and by that helps the acceleration of the of that crack. And that's a, a pretty interesting thing to see in, indeed on those uh, satellite pictures. It's really, really nice. And we have more pictures for you. We have a aerial uh, selection of aerial pictures here um, where the scientists are flying over the McDonald's ice rumpled, um, ice rumples, where you really see those waves. That's not clouds. That's the ice shelf. That's the layer of ice thick as honey, um, thicker as honey, but uh, viscous <laughs> as honey. And you can you can see when I um, when I talk about the finger, the finger is here where almost where the uh, the wing of that um of that airplane ends yeah, you can see how the the waves in the ice um yeah, flow circular around that one specific tip of the uh of the rumples you can't really see the tip because it's underwater but so, so that's the mountain sticking grounded. up from under the water pretty much exactly it's basically where the ice shelf just runs onto the uh, onto the mountains underwater it's like a ship that runs aground if you like 
and you can see how it breaks off yeah the 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 ice rumples they form kind of the the outer border and when the ice just moves around the ice rumples you have the pre-formed cracks already and that's where the ice will break off and forms larger icebergs but not really significantly large in terms of um superlatives and, and, the, and on the photo i mean it might be misleading the size that you the impression of size that you get from the photo this is a pretty significant area we're looking at here this is this might be i don't know 10 20 kilometers across probably yeah yeah the ice the ice rumpels i think it's about uh, between five and ten kilometers across. oh ten kilometers okay but still i mean yeah. It doesn't look like 10 kilometers from up here because you have no red. No, yeah. This is this is the photographer in me speaking. You, it, With these kind of things, you need something to relate to. You would need a building there or a, a vehicle or something. But now if you put a car or something down there to compare to, you wouldn't see it because it would be too small. So uh, it, it really is difficult to grasp the scale of things if you don't have anything you know that you can compare it to. So... That's so I'm true, so it. true. And we have one more selection of uh, of pictures. This and is that's, from uh, National Geographic. Indeed. And you can see here how the, the, the king penguins are just uh, uh, crashing in front of the ice uh, shelf edge. You can see the, uh, the edge right. of the ice shelf and the fast ice connected to the edge of the ice, which is just floating on the ocean surface. That's just the sea ice. And then we have a close-up of that section where the uh, Chasm 1 crack um, yeah, moves towards the Halloween crack and the McDonald ice uh, ramples. Wow. And you can also see the speed on which it traveled on its uh, high, uh, highest um, uh, time, or uh, yeah, the, the, the highest speed traveling. It was four kilometers a year. That's a tremendous speed of a crack prolonging. And still, you can see from October to to uh, February, it still is uh, a good hundred meters, two hundred meters. Um, so it it's really not clear if the crack just extends towards the ice rumples or if it will meet the Halloween crack earlier. It doesn't really matter. And the moment the chasm hits uh, the ice rumples, the Halloween crack will also give give up because the the sheer pressure will be um too 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 large and what's really difficult here is the further the um large chasm one crack moves towards the right side of that picture towards the east and meets the halloween crack at some point the more instable the entire ice shelf will become and that's something that scientists can't really grasp at this moment it's a, a so big, there's no way to uh, predict what direction a crack will take no okay. no not really no because this is really uh i mean you could analyze probably from from underneath if you could see something from from the uh, bottom of the ice shelf from the top you can't see uh, pretty much where it goes un until it breaks how thick is the ice shelf stage. here it's just 60 70 meters it's not too thick just 60 70 meters <laughs> <laughs> yeah compared to other ice shows <laughs> okay it's true yeah ah. but what happened what happened here let's go back to the penguins um from the from the ice shaft to the penguins so those penguins um after the far ice just disappeared they just relocated and that's a very interesting result, a very interesting finding in the penguin research. Because of their breeding habitat on sea ice, they are very much affected by climate change. And scientists weren't really sure how that will happen, if they will adopt a new um, developments or not. And now we've seen that the break of, uh, break of, of the fast ice at Halley Bay relocated uh, a majority of those um, emperor penguins further to the west to uh, glacier on the west edge of the Brunt uh, ice shelf uh, which is called Dawson Lambton uh, glacier and that so glacier is actually that's outside the danger zone right 
it's not entirely outside the danger zone. And that really depends on what the iceberg will do when it breaks off. If it will travel slightly further west, then it might crash the, um, the, the fast ice there as well. That's something that's difficult to say. It's really, there are a lot of factors coming in. But is this, However, is, is this the potential for like a huge extinction event for uh, the emperor penguins? Are there other colonies that will still survive this? Or is this the main one? It's the it's second largest. It used to be the second largest one. So okay. the, the ma majority has uh, relocated to that new spot. It's not an extinction event, uh, event right now. So we, we, we've seen that three years of uh, a catastrophic breeding failure, it shrinks the population, of course. It's not growing. It's, it's, it's simply not pro uh, producing any, any um, juveniles, any outcomes, any new penguins mm -hmm. there. So it has an effect on the population. They are already in danger. They're near threatened. Um, but the bright side, the, the slight glimpse on the horizon is that the same technology that showed the disappearing colony here has also revealed years later, and that's just uh, was just published beginning of this year, has uh, revealed new colonies that were not known before. We're talking about 11 new emperor penguin colonies unknown before. And how was that possible? How can you actually see emperor penguin colonies from space? Do you have an idea? Is it a heat signature thing? Is it thermal or? No, it's much, much more basic. It's the poop oh, of <laughs> of the penguins it's the the guano. <laughs> it's the poop they eat they, f they feed mainly on fish and on krill so their digestive system um colors everything pretty much uh brownish reddish and you can see those areas very clear on our satellite imagery and um we we have one picture here for you um as well where you can get a glimpse on what we're talking about. It's not easy to spot. You need a very high resolution picture. <laughs> and even on a high resolution picture, it might still be just a, a flaw in the in the picture. But here you can see you have those spreads, which are kind yeah, reddish brownish colored um, in the vicinity of large icebergs close to the edge of either the, the, the ice shelf or the land itself. You really can see that's a typical emperor penguin spot. It's the same guy who, um, yeah, who who defined or who found out about the um, the dying um, penguin colony, the second largest one. Who found that? And that's a, a scientist from the British uh, Antarctic Survey, of course, who is studying for. Uh, for 30 years, he's studying um, not only penguins, he's a, ge uh, a geograph, actually, uh, Peter Fathwell. And it's really uh, interesting to, to read the studies. We will just link that in the show notes, also the pictures to, to give you an idea to, um, yeah, browse through them later on. It's not as easy as it sounds. Would you half guess that this is a penguin colony? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> I mean, I was wondering when you when you gave me this picture and said, "Yeah, we'll need this at the end of the show." I just saw the red arrow and pointing at something weird, so I had no idea that this was penguin poop. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so the the new colonies that uh, have been discovered by uh, those kind of pictures, they just enlarge the the recent known stock of uh, emperor penguins of about twenty percent. So it's not really significant we are talking about uh, 65 i think it's 65 uh breeding colonies around antarctica including the 10 11 new ones so that means we were talking about 55 um prior to that discovery now it's uh, 65 uh, 66 and it's only 20 percent more that's just that just shows you it's not larger ones. And the vast majority of those colonies they discovered or explored is very fragile uh, to the environmental changes right now because they're very exposed, they're very much on thin sea ice. And that um, leaves the question mark how those 
colonies will develop in the near future. That's something we we need to um, yeah to discover as well. They have been defined as canneries in the coal mine for the change of that population, for the adaption uh, possibilities and abilities of that species. And that's just what I brought for today. Wonderful. So they're not quite gone yet. Let's see where this develops. Um, do we have an idea, just as a last question, do we have an idea when this huge ice shelf will calve? Because I think from what you told us, there's no doubt it will happen. Just... When no, is it there's no happen? doubt that uh, last year and beginning of last year, NASA was just um, publishing an, a news report uh, countdown to a large carving event on, on, on that. And that's a, a non-observed sized carving event in, in that area since 1905. So that's a, a huge time span we're talking about that. So everyone's um, looking right now. All the scientists are looking Everyone's looking. There. Yes. Okay. Yes. It's it's known since since uh, 2016 that it causes um, uh, a, a large threat to the uh, scientific research there in the area, and they're just waiting for it to happen. Okay. Um, well, let's keep our eyes open, and if something happens, we'll definitely talk about it here. Um, we hope you enjoyed this episode. If you have remarks or if you miss a topic you think we should cover, if you want to get a more like a detailed insight on something or an update on a previous topic or you just want to let us know how much you like this podcast, just get in touch. Write a small email or something to info at curiouslypolar.com. You can find us online at uh, curiouslypolar.com. All the episodes are there on Twitter at curiouslypolar, on Insta at curiouslypolar. We're curiouslypolar everywhere. And um, yeah, we'll be back with another great episode pretty soon. Until then, everyone, take care and bye-bye. Bye-bye.